I'm Brian Kirshner. I'm professor of bassoon here at Central Connecticut State University. And I'm going to be talking to you today about the region etudes for bassoon uh, for 2016. Um, let me first make some general comments about uh, playing anything uh, and preparing for any audition. First thing involves the condition of the equipment. The, uh, you have to make sure your bassoon is working, and that means it's sealing, and none of the holes are leaking, and it's in as good a playing condition as it can be. All bassoons vary in quality, of course, but whatever you have, you want it to be in tip-top shape because that can really make a difference. Second thing, reeds. Um, the reeds that you use, I don't know how all of you do it, each one does it differently, but my recommendation is always have at least three reeds that you're rotating at any one time. This is at your level. I, frankly, in my case right now, I have about 12 or 16 reeds that I can uh, rotate. But I make my own reeds, you probably don't at this point. So I would say get three every time you order reeds, and I would order them from a reputable supplier rather than getting them from the music store. There are numerous people who do this online now, and that's the best way to find uh, reeds. If you want to contact me uh, at Central Connecticut State Music Department, my email is there, and I'd be happy to suggest sources of reeds or answer any other questions that you might have. Um, next, use of air. Um, anything that you play, no matter how fast you can play it, no matter how clean your finger technique is, how fast your tongue is, none of it makes a bit of difference unless you sound good. So the first thing to think about in everything you play is making yourself sound good. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, how to do it with your practicing of these pieces. Um, that's the first thing. Um, putting your best foot forward, what are the judges looking for when they hear uh, these auditions? I've done them many times in various states, including Connecticut. And I can tell you the first thing that we are often put off by in an audition is someone who plays very fast, uh, misses a few notes, but does not sound good. That's the first thing. So we want someone who produces a good sound, whose finger technique is well practiced and even. Uh, if, if those things are not there, uh, then it's going to be difficult to move to the top of the, uh, of the line with this and be successful in your auditions. Um, I would also ask you, if you're going to be using this uh, clini uh, clinic tape that I'm making, put measure numbers in your etudes that you're using. Put a measure number at the beginning of each line. Uh, discounting repeats, just ignore the repeats number at the beginning of each line. That way, as I refer to measures, you'll be able to go to it and know what I'm speaking about. Um, lastly, mark your breaths when you're going to breathe and obey your marks. Once you've made the decisions, it doesn't do any good unless you actually do it. Uh, what I do with my own uh, music is I mark a big V-shaped symbol uh, whenever I want to inhale, rather than a comma. It's just easier to see, it's more graphically uh, noticeable, and it works better for me. Uh, sometimes you'll have to actually exhale before you inhale, because if you try to take good air in on top of bad, you end up almost hyperventilating sometimes with something that goes on and on and on. So if you need to exhale, what I do is put an inverted shape of that mark before I put the breath mark itself. Those are just some tips that you could consider. Um, now, these are etudes. So let me just address the, the fact that what are etudes? Uh, etudes work on the development of specific skills. In other words, they are teaching pieces. So whenever you're doing an etude, like these two, for example, ask yourself the question, what is this etude able to help me to develop in my own playing? And I'm going to address that as I talk about these two. Let's talk about etude number 25, which is the first one that I play in this uh, tape for you. Obviously, if you look at this etude, uh, this is working on the variable ways to make leaps into the middle register. All woodwind instruments produce beyond their first octave by making an overtone of the low note. In other words, it's a sort of a harmonic that we're producing. And we do this in various ways. Many instruments have an octave key. Uh, saxophone, for instance, has an octave key. Oboe has two octave keys. Bassoon doesn't have any octave keys. And so there are various ways that we negotiate these uh, venting of the half hole to produce the upper note, which is what all these octaves really do. Um, now in this etude, particularly because of the key that it is in, uh, there's a special little difficulty, actually two, 
uh, uh, to mention, and one is the A flat. Whenever we uh, half hole on the bassoon, which you all know I hope means uncovering part of the first finger hole by rolling down, to produce the F G and the F sharp, we normally roll a pretty definite half hole size. So half of the hole is uncovered, half of it is covered. If you do that on A flat, the note will crack. So the half hole for A flat is critically small. It needs to be about a quarter hole. So learn to vent just a little bit to produce that A flat. The second thing uh, in it is the D flat. This is the upper D flat in the slurs because uh, that one doesn't have a flick fingering. And we, we all hopefully know what flicking is. I'll talk about it in a minute. All right, let's, let's talk about specifics now with this. Let me first mention this etude is difficult. And frankly, had I been asked to choose etudes, I never would have chosen this. Uh, someone did, however, and so we are kind of stuck with it. So you're going to have to do your best to, to get through this. I, I would encourage you to practice it hard, but do not practice it at long stretches because you can hurt yourself. I mean, you can develop tendon problems, thumb, thumb issues, and so on. So short stretches. Uh, don't sit and try to do it for two solid hours. You really can do some at least temporary injury to your joints doing that. Tempo. Uh, you know, pieces have little Italian uh, markings on them, and these are no different. This one says moderato assai. What that means is very moderately. The, the assai is a modifier, and moderato means slow. Now, that means a moderate tempo. Now, you say, well, what does that mean? Well, good news is it's kind of open. Uh, my recommendation is around 69 on the metronome to the quarter note on this. Uh, and uh, that should make it possible. If you need to go a little slower, trust me, the judges would rather have you go slower and have it sound better and be clean. Uh, I wouldn't get down as low as, say, 58 or something, but I mean, you know, in the 60s, I think it's, it's going to be uh, possible. Um, select your tempo based on how fast you can play the 16th notes. It has nothing to do with the 8th notes, because if you can play the 16th, certainly you can play the 8th. In fact, they're going to feel slow. But don't be tricked into thinking it's too slow because sixteenths are coming and they're twice as fast. Um, let's talk a little bit about this uh, negotiation of the leaps. Now, on the bassoon, when we half hold, as I mentioned, it means rolling the first finger down. So if I play A flat in the low position, so called A flat three, it looks like that. My whisper key is down in the back, which closes this little key up here. And when I'm going to play the upper A flat, I keep my whisper key down. This is always true of a half whole note. And I roll my first finger down ever so slightly to open up a quarter of that first hole. So that's how we do A flat. The B flat and the C, uh, which occur in here, these are what we call flickable notes. And the flick register, I hope you've had some uh, training in that. If you haven't, you, you'll, you'll learn it with this etude. But you actually brush open one of the keys on the back of the instrument. To produce the B flat and the C, then you'll finger the B flat in the low octave with the whisper key, and then come off the whisper key and brush a downward stroke on the C key, which on my bassoon is the next to the top key on the right. On your bassoon, if you don't have five keys here, it would be the top key, because some you know, student bassoons don't have this key, the D key. Flick the C key and that will produce those upper octaves. Now, D flat, that's the one I mentioned. This doesn't have a flick, and the reason is obvious, because your thumb is already fingering this key to produce the pitch of D flat. So there's nothing you can flick to produce this, and even if there were, your thumb is otherwise occupied. Well, uh, good news and bad news, there's a way to do this. Bad news is it involves a whole different fingering. D flat on the bassoon, on the staff, uh, D flat three, is produced, as you all know, by one, two, three, whisper key, C sharp key, low D key. Now, we all know, or have learned probably, that the upper octave of this is the same as that, but you take the whisper key off. So you have one, two, three, C sharp, and low D. All right, now that's fine for most things. However, it will not speak in a slur. So what you're going to be using is what's called the long D flat or C sharp fingering. Here's what it is. One, two, three, C sharp, and we remove the low D key from the fingering, which is just a stabilizer anyway, and we're going to substitute it with a different stabilizer, which is in the right hand, 
two, three, F. So whole fingering, one, two, three, C sharp, two, three, F. This is called long D flat or long C sharp. All the upper ones will be fingered using that uh, fingering. And I believe that covers the most of the fingering uh, oddities in this, at least for the leaps. Um, tempo, practice tempos and use of uh, techniques of practicing for getting this clean. First of all, always start slow. And practice the piece in slow increment, small increments. I would say, if I were learning this, I would start by learning the middle section first, which is the 16th notes. They're the hardest thing. If you can play that, you'll be able to go back and work on the beginning and the end, which are virtually the same. But this middle section needs careful attention and slow, slow practice to train your fingers to make these leaps. Do not set the metronome on a slow speed and crank it up notch by notch. Not a good idea. Delay that and keep it slow until you have trained the muscles to do what they need to do to execute these various uh, jumps and so forth in this piece. Um, after you get to a certain point with this and you have developed a nice slow routine, then you can start to move the tempo up. Here is where you can use what some people call sprints. You know what a sprint is in running. It's a, it's a very fast burst of speed for a short distance. Well, the analogy and the metaphor will be carried over to practice techniques. You'll take a small piece of, a, of, a, of the music here, maybe a couple beats, and you'll practice only those two beats, say, but at a, quite a fast tempo, a performance tempo or even a little beyond it. Then you go a little before it and, and elongate your your piece that you're doing as a sprint. You do this over and over again with the places in here which are difficult for you. Now, I would recommend breaking up this middle section into uh, several pieces, and they correspond with where you're going to breathe as well. So let me just talk about breathing in this and my suggestions of where you can put in a breath. Um, you're going to have to take a little time to breathe, and you'll notice on my performance of it, I do that. So uh, feel free to do it yourself. The judges will not penalize you for that. Um, I play the first four bars and I take a breath. Then I take a breath there and I continue until the end of that section. There's a repeat here. In my experience, I have never in any state in this union heard uh, a, a region etude played with the repeats. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time and if you feel like you don't want to risk that, then practice the repeats, but I doubt that they're going to hear the repeats in, in this. If you get through it once, they'll be more than happy. Um, so you take a, a breath at the double bar and take a nice full breath. You can even take a little longer than a quarter rest and do that. And then you start the middle section, the more challenging part. I play the first uh, two measures and then the downbeat of measure 12, which is a low G, and then I breathe again. It restarts the same music. I do that section all the way through until the middle of measure 15. Uh, right before beat three of measure 15, uh, I take another breath. This splits it up into another little chunk, which is going to take you to the end of this whole 16th note uh, section, which ends in measure 17. Take another luxurious breath, inhale, exhale, and then start the return of the music, which was like the beginning, and breathe in the analogous spot at the end of measure 21, Go all the way through, all the way up to the end of the etude. And again, don't repeat, for heaven's sakes. Uh, the 16th, if you've gotten through it once, you should be grateful that you did. Um, dynamics. There's not very much. Uh, it says at the beginning to start quietly. Uh, I probably could have done that a little more in my taping, but you should start piano. Sometimes they notice that and will mark you down if you don't do it. Uh, and then it reaches, uh, in the second phrase, it starts to crescendo up. You're going to reach a very healthy forte right before the double bar, and then you're at mezzo forte, which should be a comfortably loud mezzo forte. Uh, don't worry, just play a comfortable dynamic in that. Another crescendo to forte, you see all these in the music. Don't forget when you return to the opening material in measure 18, it says forte piano. That means piano with an accent. So you're going to come to the downbeat, boom, with an accent at forte and immediately piano and then follow the dynamics as written uh, all the way out. 
Uh, a couple of other little fingering things that maybe have helped you. There is a high C in this. I don't know how many of you have had the experience of, of playing high C, but it's not difficult. The note speaks very easily if you finger it correctly. You don't have to bite or anything to get it to come out. The fingering should be the C key, which is the top key on the right-hand side uh, of the instrument right here. Okay, You notice not the top for me, that's the top, but for you, the fourth key up, is the C key. The rest of the fingering involves one in the left hand, the E flat key here, which we call the resonance key, one, two, B flat and F will produce high C. Right hand, one, two, B flat and F. Um, a flat in the upper octave is done a lot of different ways. I would suggest as your normal stock fingering, if you learn half hole two, three, whisper key, resonance key three, which is this, that's the standard high A flat, I would do that and I would add in the right hand two and B flat. This should be your standard go-to fingering for, for that A flat four. It's gonna speak a lot better for you in most cases. It's less sharp, less fragile, and uh, it will work better for you in general. Um, the upper E flats in this, I recommend that you finger them one, two, two, three. And I, in, in fact, I finger almost all upper E flats that way. Some people include the first finger. Uh, I don't, and I think uh, if you try it, you'll see that it's a, a more um, workable and helpful fingering. This is not an easy etude, and it's gonna require slow, uh, patient practice. And in the audition, you're gonna miss a couple of things. They expect that, don't worry about it. They're, they're after really looking at the fact that you have negotiated this and learned what can be learned from this A2. The second etude uh, that you'll be learning for the region uh, auditions this year is number 31, again from the Weissenborn. I didn't mention at the outset, but uh, the Weissenborn etudes are the standard set of etudes that all bassoonists learn from. There are 50 of them, at least in its current version, and it's sort of the second volume of a, a book called The Weissenborn Method, and it is trusted and known for it was written in the late 1800s, for heaven's sake, and so it's been around a long time. Um, now let's talk about uh, 31. If you look at this one, you'll ask yourself the same question about, as you did about 25. What is this trying to help me to do and help me to learn to do better? Well, this is clearly uh, not so much about leaping. As a matter of fact, it's all stepwise, but this is also in four flats, which uh, I don't know why they chose both of them in the same general key, but it all involves this A-flat business about which I spoke. So that note will crack very easily, even fine professional bassoons it happens to. So getting the quarter hole the right size and getting in and out of it uh, is one thing you'll learn. Second thing, a more overarching thing, <coughs> is developing a fluid finger technique because most of this, in fact, all of it, is slurred uh, in uh, larger groups. So uh, are your fingers even? How to get this is to practice with a metronome. 
get yourself a metronome, whether it's an application on your phone, which are fine, or get yourself a metronome. They're not very expensive, 20 or $30. Uh, usually battery powered is best. And uh, use them and really stay with it. Uh, if you feel like you're having trouble staying with the metronome, just remember, it's not the metronome's problem. It's correct. It's a clock. So what you need to do is learn to stay with that machine, which is the truth about the beat. Uh, I would start, this is in 6-8, I would put the metronome so it's clicking every eighth note initially. This is going to help you stay slow initially, which you need to do, and it will also keep you more honest in terms of the execution of the, of the finger technique. Um, now let's talk specifically uh, about it. This is, good news is this is easier than number 25 by a long shot. Number 25 is considered by many to be the hardest etude in the entire collection. Certainly one of them, if not the hardest. This is easier, but no walk in the park either, but it's, it's, you can, you can man handle this one, I believe, in an easier way. Um, the tempo. I have this marked as I was working on it for this purpose at about 72 to the dotted quarter. So I would mark it that way and a little slower is fine. What does it mean when it says andante quasi allegretto? Well, it means andante approaching allegretto. So we're really looking at an andante but on the faster side. And andante means a walking tempo, not slow. So this is not overly quick. Now the fact that it's all 16th notes is going to mitigate the speed. If this was only eighth notes, it would be a very different question of what that means in terms of metronomic speed. But because they're sixteenths, it's going to take it down quite a bit lower in the metronomic uh, speed in order to make it playable. Um, dynamics. Uh, great news on this one. There aren't any except for just a couple. I think there's only one crescendo. And the whole thing is marked mezzo forte. So you are free to play a good, healthy, comfortable, dynamic level which sounds full and resonant and uh, don't don't try to hold back air as you do it there are repeats in this and as in the other one i would recommend don't take them uh, i don't i can't imagine a scenario where you're going to be asked to um, and certainly the second repeat that's even more true than the first but i, I don't think they're going to ask either repeat in my experience that they don't slow slow practice in this is the key uh, don't play faster until your fingers have learned their, uh, their role and what to do. And go over and over it for many, many days at this slow tempo before you begin slowly to move it up. So you're going to be going a couple clicks up maybe every day once you've had a week, for example, at the very, very slow initial tempo. Now you might say, how slow is my initial tempo? I can't tell you that. Uh, everybody has an initial starting speed. Uh, I always recommend to students, don't start by reading through the piece at performance tempo. All you are doing is building in habits you're going to have to correct later. Start at the slow practice speed. That should be your first initiation to any piece that you are learning. Uh, once you get that down, then you can do the short sprints that I spoke of earlier, uh, which means bursts of notes at the fast speed. There is a, a, a misconception, I find, among uh, people that they think that if they practice it just slow, then they'll magically be able to play it fast. Uh, this is simply not true. Uh, we do have to practice fast, but not until you're ready. And I would say the short bursts at the fast speed, which I call sprints, uh, are a way to get at this. Let's talk about fingering uh, in this. It's less involved than the other one. Um, I uh, reiterate my uh, uh, comments about the A-flat-3, quarter hole on the first hole or they will split, uh, guaranteed. Uh, for the E-flat uh, on the staff, I would use the very simplest one, which is one and three in the whisper key. Uh, I hope all of you have been taught to use a right hand block with that fingering, which on most bassoons is the same left hand I just mentioned, one, three, whisper. The right hand, one and B flat is what I use, uh, or it can be two and B flat. These are the standard ways to stabilize that note. That said, if your reed is working properly, just the left hand should work for most of this piece. And uh, I've, over the recent decade, become 
very uh, much of a stickler about making my reads so that that note will, will, will be in tune without any extra fingers if I need it to be. There are a couple places where I would urge you to use a full E flat, and uh, I have marked these uh, for you. Uh, one is in measure 13. I would use a full E flat there because the E flat is on a strong beat and it recurs several times in the uh, measure. I would also use it in measure 34 in that instance. So these are some places where I would suggest the full fingering. Now, one place where fingering becomes uh, a little tricky is in measure 17. This is where you have the little middle section, which is only two lines long. Problem is, they have you in the first two measures, 17 and 18 of this section, they have you going up a scale, that's all good, but then you're supposed to go B flat to D flat. Now, that means right hand to left hand, and back and forth and back and forth. That's difficult to do cleanly. So I don't do it. I use a different fingering for that. And uh, your teacher may not want you to do this, and you should always go with what they say. My recommendation is to finger the D flat one, two, one. So the technique for this will look like the following. You'll be playing B flat, and instead of going right to left like that, which will be sloppy, I guarantee, you're going to go B flat, D flat, B flat, D flat, B flat, D flat. So you just pick up enough fingers, you're left with one, two, one. And you'll find that although it's a little stuffy, it's quite in tune, that pitch. The other places in here, uh, in that same section I should mention, would be um, right before the fermata over the bar line, which is measure 23 and 24. Uh, in this spot, you have to be a little bit careful because of the A flat leaps to the A flat, etc. Uh, my recommendation would be this. I'll tell you a little thing that I do, which you can try if it helps you. For the first beat of measure 23, put the low C sharp key down as you play the G to the A flat. It will help to resonate both notes and act as a, as a fingering helps both. Then on the second beat, keep your right hand down for what you would need to play the A flats and just open the left hand to produce the F. It's going to help the A flats keep them from cracking and it'll just be smoother. So the right hand down uh, for the second beat in measure 23 right hand down for G in the same fashion in measure 24 for the second uh, measure of that, the first beat, then E, G, normal fingerings for the last burst of 16th. Then a wonderful moment of fermata, but it's over the bar line. So what does that mean? It means you can take as long a breath as you want within reason. So exhale, inhale, and get yourself set up for the, uh, the rest of it. Let me mention what I do with breaths for the rest of this, and you can uh, try it and see if it works for you. Uh, younger players, especially because you're smaller in stature and also less experienced, will need more frequent breaths than I might. Uh, but I'm just telling you what I'm doing in this instance. I play the beginning all the way up through measure 12, and I take a big breath, and then I go the rest of the way to the double bar. I take a good inhale, exhale, I restart in 17 and I go up to the fermata uh, at the end of measure 24, and I slow down a tiny bit on the last group of 16th, just so it doesn't sound like I'm running into a wall there. I'm going to stop after all. And then I take a good inhale, exhale. I restart in 25. Then I roughly go two lines. Uh, this is at the end of measure 32, I breathe. Then I go another line at the end of measure 36, uh, and I breathe. I go another line at the end of measure 43, and I breathe. And then I go from 41 all the way out. I'm sorry, it was 40, I breathe. And then 41 all the way to the end, I go in one breath. Uh, in 41, by the way, use the simplest A flat, which is just the third finger in the right hand uh, for that. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I should mention. Uh, in developing even technique for this, there is a, a very bad practice out there that's, which is kind of rampant, and that is we're taught to accent every beat. Uh, this not only will not help you be even, it will cause the music to have unnecessary bumps in it. You're going to be fine on the beats anyway. The problem is between the beats. So rather than thinking 
I would think of the second to the sixth sixteenths in the group leading to the next onbeat note. So you're going to have always forward motion. And it will roll forward in that way. No accents, and uh, you'll be much better for it. I'm most happy to uh, help anyone who has any specific questions with this, and as I mentioned earlier in this, uh, just go to the CCSU Music Department site. You will find uh, my email there, and uh, you can also call my office. Email is probably easiest. I'd be more than happy to make suggestions about how to do this, how to practice. Uh, if you want to have a lesson on it, I'd be even happy to do that and help you with reads and so forth. So please do. And I uh, will close just by wishing everybody the best of luck with these. Uh, take your time in your practicing. Don't hurt yourself because they are, they are difficult. And best of luck to everyone this year.